The Royal College of Physicians recently released UK clinical guidelines for the diagnosis of fibromyalgia syndrome. Today I'll be summarising this to help you identify and diagnose fibromyalgia more confidently. If you're wondering what exactly fibromyalgia is and how to explain this to patients, I covered this in a video last week. So if you haven't already watched that video, it may be a good idea to watch that one after this one today. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Mahin and I'm an advanced practice physiotherapist specialising in pain management based in the UK. On this channel, we explore ways to improve our interactions with those living with pain to help them create healthier and happier lives. As I mentioned in my previous video, fibromyalgia is common with a worldwide prevalence of around 2%. However, its nature has historically been misunderstood with patients reporting that they've been made to feel like the condition isn't real. The diagnosis of fibromyalgia can be challenging though, as there are no clinical investigations to confirm or rule out its presence. There's also often multiple symptoms all existing at once, fluctuating in nature, and the condition doesn't really sit within any known diagnostic categories. This has led to incorrect diagnosis, years of delay before receiving a correct diagnosis of fibromyalgia, or even being incorrectly diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Therefore, a consultation that leads to an accurate diagnosis can be a really important moment in helping somebody move forwards, beginning to self-manage, and can be hugely reassuring, none of which should be underestimated. Previously, it's been rheumatologists that have made the diagnosis of fibromyalgia after ruling out other causes to widespread pain. However, it doesn't need to only be rheumatologists, as any diagnosticians, such as GPs and physiotherapists, are really well placed to diagnose fibromyalgia. This is why it's important that all clinicians should be able to interpret the diagnostic criteria and recognize other symptoms that may suggest another condition, even when fibromyalgia is coexisting. Clinicians should be alert to the presence of fibromyalgia if any of the following factors on the image on the right occur either in isolation or in combination. Patients with fibromyalgia may not report widespread pain if their appointment is for one isolated problem such as lower back pain or shoulder pain. Usually patients will report their worst pain when they're coming in uh, to see either the GP or, or the physiotherapist. So sometimes a little bit of further questioning around any other area body parts that are painful can be helpful. It can also be quite confusing for patients when they are experiencing widespread pain and often they only talk about the area that makes the most sense to them. So for example, weird back pain and slipped discs because they can kind of fathom what's potentially going on there. Whereas when they're getting widespread pain in lots of different areas of the body, that's a bit more confusing and they may not report on all of those uh, areas that are painful. So that's why it's important to directly ask them about other painful body areas. Looking back at the notes and the history sometimes can be helpful because if they've had multiple appointments for pain in different body parts, then that can suggest that they may be experiencing widespread pain. It's really important to recognize the challenge of shifting focus from a regional structural abnormality to a widespread pain condition where it's now the nervous system that is in a more sensitized state, which leads to activities that weren't previously painful, like walking, for example, being more painful now. So fatigue may include physical fatigue, such as a lack of energy or exhaustion. It also may include cognitive fatigue in the form of difficulties with concentration, memory, and also experiencing brain fog, or even emotional fatigue in the form of reduced motivation and all of these forms of fatigue may present together. Increased sensitivity to sound, light, or temperature may represent changes to peripheral or central nervous system sensory processing. Also, widespread tenderness on examination or reports of increased sensitivity after manual treatments or exercise can also indicate hypersensitivity. So pain that has been there for longer than three months is termed chronic or persistent. So this relates to the longevity of symptoms and not to the severity of symptoms. And this is because normal tissue healing time is usually up to three months. So any pain that lasts for longer than three months, such as fibromyalgia, it's more likely there are multiple factors involved with this. And a lot of the time with fibromyalgia, it's not down to tissue changes alone. Drug treatments for chronic primary pain are usually ineffective in the long term, both in clinical trials and also in lived experience with those living with pain. As a general rule, the longer that we take a medication for, the less effective it becomes over time because of the buildup of tolerance. Rehabilitation focused solely on manual treatments, such as mobilizations and massages or vigorous exercises are often ineffective past the short term and can actually increase pain levels. The poor effect from pain medication and standard rehab approaches indicates that there is an abnormal pain processing occurring that is the dominant factor rather than a structural inflammatory 
or psychological cause. Due to the multiple symptoms, subsequent distress and disability, and also the lack of clarity around a diagnosis or cause, can often make patients feel quite overwhelmed. And we see this articulated in many different ways by patients, and it's the clinician's skill to pick up on this and identify that actually this complex presentation may be a representation of fibromyalgia. And it's not just patients, healthcare professionals can also feel quite overwhelmed during consultations with people with fibromyalgia. And this can be important information to take, and it may actually point towards fibromyalgia if these feelings are felt during the consultation. A two-question screening tool has often been used in consultations to help identify those at risk of developing fibromyalgia or those who already may have fibromyalgia. And the two questions are, over the past two weeks, has your pain been bad enough to interfere with your day-to-day -day activities? And then the second question, over the past two weeks, have you felt worried or low in mood because of this pain? As mentioned at the beginning of the video, the responsibility of diagnosing fibromyalgia has moved away from medical professionals to any clinician who can adequately diagnose it. And this means that hopefully it's picked up earlier in the process and people can get the correct information about the condition. As with all chronic pain consultations, it's really important to acknowledge the patient's life situation. And this is because it may be the first time that this patient feels listened to and has the opportunity to tell their story. And this alone can have a really therapeutic effect and can be really, really important for managing in the long term. It's also really important to allow sufficient time. So this might be organizing a longer appointment or a double appointment or arranging a series of appointments with set goals on what you're gonna discuss in those appointments and then things to work towards. In other settings, when new referrals are coming in with the lead symptom being chronic pain or chronic widespread pain, it's probably appropriate to allow for sufficient time for that consultation because of the complexity that may come with it. And if sufficient time isn't available, then referral onto a clinic or a specialty service where this time is available is probably appropriate there. Ideally, face-to-face -face consultations are best for diagnosing fibromyalgia. And fibromyalgia should not only be diagnosed, after a patient has self-completed one of the diagnostic forms, because it's really important to pick up on other clinical information to, that leads to the diagnosis, not only the patient completing the diagnostic form, which we're gonna go through in a moment. And with anything, the most important thing is communication. So making sure the diagnosis is communicated well, providing some education, but also signposting to some resources online or providing written information that the patient can go home with and they can have a read through in their own time. Any questions then that they may have, they can bring to you in the next appointment. The Royal College of Physicians agreed that the best evidence-based guideline for diagnosing fibromyalgia is the American College of Rheumatology's 2016 diagnostic criteria. The criteria consists of a widespread pain index, which includes the number of painful body parts present for more than three months, and an associated symptom severity scale that includes symptoms of fatigue, poor concentration and memory, unrefreshed sleep, stomach pains, depression, and headache. The widespread pain index has a maximum score of 19 and the symptom severity scale has a maximum score of 12. To make a diagnosis using the ACR criteria, the following needs to be present. So it's either widespread pain index of equal to or more than seven and a symptom severity scale score of more than or equal to five, or a widespread pain index of four to six and a symptom severity scale score of more than nine. There also needs to be generalized pain, defined as pain in at least four of the five body regions. So that's um, all four limbs and spinal as well. And then finally, symptoms must have been present at a similar level for at least three months. Patients with symptoms just below this threshold may be diagnosed with fibromyalgia if the threshold symptoms are documented from a recent assessment. In case of any uncertainty with this diagnosis though, you can always refer to a specialist with experiencing in diagnosing fibromyalgia. And usually this is either a pain specialist or a rheumatologist. So it's really important to be aware that fibromyalgia is not a diagnosis of exclusion. There are also no specific diagnostic tests for fibromyalgia, but fibromyalgia can also be present when there are other conditions, uh, particularly rheumatology conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus or axial spondyloarthritis. And a diagnosis of fibromyalgia is valid irrespective of other diagnosis. So fibromyalgia can still coexist with other conditions. But clinicians that are diagnosing or considering a diagnosis of fibromyalgia should be aware of certain conditions that can mimic some of the symptoms of fibromyalgia. So some of the conditions that mimic fibromyalgia are as follows. So you can have endocrine disease, such as hyperthyroidism, rheumatic conditions, such as ankylosing spondylitis, uh, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, polymyalgia rheumatica, neurological diseases, such as neuropathies, myopathies, or MS, drug-induced conditions from things like statins, aromatase inhibitors, high-dose opioids causing opioid-induced hyperalgesia, sleep disorders, such as sleep apnea, 
chronic fatigue syndrome or ME, depression, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or hypermobility spectrum disorder, or more relevant to recent events, long COVID. And any of these conditions may also be present alongside fibromyalgia. So things like blood tests and other investigations can be helpful to differentiate between the two or know if something else is present in the presence of fibromyalgia as well. So where signs and symptoms of fibromyalgia are clear, it's not always necessary to refer on for a specialist opinion for a diagnosis, because as I mentioned before, any clinician who is able to can diagnose fibromyalgia. But having said that, an onward referral to a specialist service for diagnostic reasons may be appropriate for the following reasons. If fibromyalgia symptoms are unclear, if there is clear diagnostic uncertainty, so there may be a presence of a rheumatological condition or a neuro logical condition, in the presence of complex multiple health conditions, and if there are symptoms that need further investigation that sits outside of the clinician's scope of practice. So the referral options for either confirming a diagnosis of fibromyalgia or ruling out any other potential conditions usually include pain management services, rheumatology services, and neurology services. And availability of these services and pathways vary across the UK and in other countries as well. So it's important to check what's available in your local area so that you know these pathways and you know that if you have a patient that may be experiencing signs and symptoms of fibromyalgia and there is a bit of uh, uncertainty around the diagnosis, that you know that who you can refer to in your particular area. To understand more about what fibromyalgia is so that you can explain this to your patients with more confidence, or get a better understanding of what fibromyalgia is if you're living with it yourself, check out last week's part one video. Thanks for watching, take care, and I'll see you next week.